IT Leadership Insights. Talks on software development and IT challenges with tech leaders. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of IT Insights by Future Processing. John Nealand is my guest today, and I'm super excited and looking forward to discussing uh, how self-worth um, is important in business in the professional life today uh, in these crazy times. Uh, John, thank you for joining me. Thanks, uh, Michal. Great to be here. And indeed, we are in crazy times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, John is best known as a professional speaker and, and coach, supporting professionals, building a stronger career identity rooted in self-worth and self-belief. That's that's your LinkedIn description. Could you shed some more light and explain you know, who you are? What is it that you do? Uh, what is it that you talk about? Well, for a long time, I have been, um, for over 20 years now, I have been coaching professionals on all kinds of issues of performance, how to grow their business, how to get more done, all the usual performance-based coaching stuff. And about 10 years ago, I began to get a bit concerned about what I was doing, because I, I noticed that while there were many good aspects to it, um, very often um, my work was confirming people in their struggle with performance, in their struggle with their uh, reputation with themselves, if you like. And then a few years later, when I had uh, some of my own um, difficulties in, in 2016, uh, it was a very, a very difficult life for me. And if you've, uh, if you've read the book, you know, you've probably seen some of that. And um, I, I discovered that actually for most of my life, I'd been running on this thing, or the, on this fuel called self-esteem. Um, our reputation with ourselves, as Nathaniel Brandon defines it. And he ought to know because he wrote about seven books on the subject. Yeah. And I'd been running on that for a long time and um, began to understand that I needed another fuel source. And the reason I uh, ended up writing the book is that that started um, a, a whole new discovery uh, for me in terms of how we show up, how we present ourselves, how we lead uh, how we think about our careers, um, because self-worth is fundamentally different to self-esteem. That was supposed to be my first question. There's different fuels that you mentioned in the book, self-worth, self-confidence, self-esteem, other esteem. What's, what's the difference and why, from your perspective, self-worth is the ultimate, uh, let's say, uh, fuel that we should we should run on well it um it's a secret fuel at the moment <laughs> there's, there's actually very little um explore in comparison with self self uh, esteem on which books have been written courses abound um self worth is largely unexplored um, there's very little on self worth but to answer your question um you know confidence confidence is how we present ourselves to the world um it can be real it can be faked but either way, it's uh, confidence is the the presenting self, mm -hmm. if you like. Uh, and of course, everybody wants to be confident. You know, we generally feel better when we're confident. True. Um, self esteem is our reputation with ourselves, and for that reason, it fluctuates. Uh, on a day when you get everything done on your to do list and the clients are buying and everyone's happy with your services, well, of course, self-esteem will be higher. Um, but not all days are like that. And we've just been through the pandemic, which has uh, actually uh, created a lot of um, bumpy rides uh, for people in terms of their self-esteem. Um, in many cases, they've lost the things that define their self-esteem, their job title, their um, position in the office, their desk, you know, um, sometimes lost health um, or, or family members. And, and um, these external markers uh, are very important in terms of how we define our self-esteem. Self-worth is different. Self-worth, first of all, comes from inside rather than outside. And most importantly, it's unconditional. So it does not depend on your performance and it does not depend on your behavior. So if on a given day you don't do everything that's on your to-do list or you don't go to the gym or you get rejected, whether in business or in love or whatever it might be, um, you can still have self-worth. 
because there are no conditions for it. That's a very interesting concept. I'm still trying to get my my head around it. I'm I'm just finishing the book, so as mm. I said before, please don't spoil the ending. <laughs> um, but I was really curious, where did it all come from? All come from? I mean, you, you mentioned that it was your own uh, way of coping with the situation, but was it like any anyone influenced you, or how did you actually you know came across the the, the idea of finding self worth as the fuel? Um, like many adults of my generation, um, I had been living on self-esteem for a long time. Um, and to be honest, that was good. I mean, it, it was an advance on what came before, which was about adherence to structures and mm-hmm. rules and regulations. Yeah, we so, all live in a certain, let's say, um, social agreement that we comply with, more or less. So I guess we all played the same rules. Yeah. And I grew up in a very traditional um, social setting in in the West of Ireland in the 1960s. So um, it was religiously quite um, dogmatic. Mm -hmm. It was socially quite restricted. And in many ways, um, you know, excellence was about um, doing the things you were supposed to do. Of course. Yeah. Defining your own way didn't come into it. <laughs> um, so self-esteem was it was a good thing and it served me well for quite a few decades. But in 2016, uh, a success uh, when a succession of losses happened in my life, both personally and professionally. Um, and the details are in the book, so I'm not going <laughs> to, I won't spoil the read for anyone. But by the end of 2016, my energy was very low. Um, I felt like an imposter in my coaching work because, you know, by then I'm speaking at conferences and, on, and you know, motivating people in their performance. And I was not feeling that level of motivation that I was, you know, putting across to other people. Um, and when you're a coach and when you're a speaker, uh, you get a double whammy, you know, when you have a down day uh, because you're not supposed to have that. And of course, I came across all the good stuff on, on self-compassion and accepting and, you know, these very worthy things. But I was unable to apply a lot of them because I just didn't have one until I started to work on it at that, at that time. I did not have an unconditional loyalty to, to myself or friendship with myself. My friendship with myself was was very much conditional upon what I was doing, what people thought, what I thought of myself, et cetera. This unconditional, the the aspect of this unconditionality is is what, from my perspective, sets apart self-worth from self-esteem. But I guess there's there's way more reasons why self-worth is now more important than ever. especially from the perspective of, for example, career development in the professional setting. Could you, could you elaborate a bit on that? Well, even before the pandemic, there was a lot of transition around. Uh, a lot of people were in career transition, um, either because the world was changing from under them or mm-hmm. in many cases because they were choosing it. You know, not everybody Uh, wants a traditional job role in the way that that might have been conceived of 10 years ago. And then, of course, the pandemic comes along and accelerates digitalization, you know, to a factor of fourfold, at least, possibly even more. Um, And then hot on the heels of the pandemic, we have the ongoing uh, Ukraine crisis, Mm -hmm. uh, bringing yet another wave of uncertainty. Um, as, as you well know, um, and the if if we look at the net effects of that, um, there are now shock waves of uncertainty rippling right across the economy as we know it. On top of which, we're all going to be in it for longer. I mean, unless something really bad happens, um, uh, because we're going to have longer working lives. And it was all very well to have a single career or two careers, maybe when. When your working career was going to be a four decade span but now that's going to be a six decade span very soon 
um, we're going to have longer working lives um, simply because uh, of the uh, growth in, in longevity, in human longevity. Mm-hmm. And we, we can't spend 40 years in our retirement because uh, the funding isn't there for it. Yeah. So the demographics are uh, cruel. Uh, plus the demographic factor, indeed. So we have a whole, uh, and I haven't even mentioned artificial intelligence yet, the, you know, uh, future processing, you will be more aware of than I am. <laughs> so if we look at all of that together, we are going to see more career transitions. Um, it will not be unusual for someone, even at very established senior level in an organization, to have three, four, or five significant careers over the course of their lives. Um, and hence, we're um, now what happens during transition, as we've seen in the pandemic, people lose the reference points that define their self esteem. So it's very easy for mental health problems to kick in during transition. Mm-hmm. And we see this with the young at university. We see this with people who are struggling to leave the corporate world and get into the independent business world. Uh, we also see it often quite tragically um, when people um, attempt to transition into retirement and, and fail to do so. Um, quite a number of issues, uh, both health issues and, and mental health issues, uh, kick in in the over 50 space as well. So. Self, the, the, the way we relate to ourselves is mega important during transition. And that applies to individuals and it also applies to teams. There's definitely plenty of uh, driving factors uh, increasing this level of vulnerability and fragility in, within individuals recently, more than ever, and as, you, as you described. Once we were already uh, like looking at the light in the tunnel of the pandemic, it just it just happened so that we just stepped into uh, another huge um, huge disruptor. Um, but I understand that someone who is uh, rooted in self-worth can cope with these challenges better as a source of productivity and energy. And, and value. And this value aspect is something I would like to uh, maybe focus on a bit. Because uh, in the book that you, you stated that self-worth, when it comes to, to, to this value added, allows you to stop or transition from chasing your, your role or a project to, uh, to building a clear identity uh, and understanding of the value within and outside that you bring. Uh, in the professional setting, yeah, can you can you explain some more of that? Indeed. So again, it goes back to the transition. So I coach quite a lot of people who have held different roles in the course of their lives, and sometimes this is quite difficult to connect, um, and that can uh, sometimes damage their credibility, even on their CV or when they go for interview. Um, because there's a lack of a red line, there's a, a lack of a connecting thread sometimes between the diverse roles that they've done. So from many points of view, from an identity point of view, from a credibility point of view, it's important to find that connecting thread. And generally speaking, in a changing world, you're not going to find that in job roles. That's about what we do. What we need to focus on is who we are at work. You know, who are you as a leader? Who are you as a consultant? Who are you as a trainer? If, if that indeed is, uh, is a role anymore, because I think there's training involved in just about every role now. Um, they, you know, going beyond some of these labels to, you know, are you a visionary? Are you a disruptor? Are you a relationship builder? You know, finding the the red thread that runs through all of your roles to date and that you'd like to run into your future roles, whatever they may be. That's about identity. Uh, That's that's not about job titles. Uh, It's not about benefits. It's not about, um, you know, it's not about the periphery, the peripheral nature of our careers. It's putting who we are at work front and central. 
it sounds really easy and super hard at the same time. Uh, these are the, the, the very fundamental and basic questions. I guess everyone, at least, like that was my perception, at least anyone was trying to, to ask themselves. But uh, these are the questions that I always, for example, myself struggle to find answers to. Yeah. They are the, and they are, of course, fluctuating over time. It's not something that you set up for for uh, for ages and you stay with for good, especially in the context uh, that that where you mentioned that we will be more and more focused on, uh, or forced to, or looking to move the ladder to a different wall, uh, mm-hmm. metaphorically speaking, in the career uh, scenario scenarios. Um, how is the, 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 one of the last questions I, w- I would like to ask you, John, is related to self-worth in the, in the professional context of the relations with the customer and the client, because often bad relation or a tough customer of, or a tough client defines self-esteem or self-confidence can boost it or can kill it. How, how leveraging your approach can be helpful? Well, this is probably one of the most fascinating ways in which you see the difference between self-esteem based client management and self-worth based client management. So self-esteem based client management invariably is about chasing good ratings from the client. So to chase good ratings, we become much better at client service. We do our best to accommodate their short term requests, long term requests. We you know, it's it's a client. It's not so much a client service relationship as a client servitude relationship. Oh yeah, very yeah. often. Client is always right. Absolutely. Whereas with self worth, we start to form different relationships with clients. We um, rather than struggling to meet requirements, we aim to shape requirements together with the client. We become partners with them rather than servants with them. Because we're not dependent upon their feedback to value our own work and to value our own contribution. Now, I know it's radical, and I can imagine it is. And some people yeah, listening just, to it will go, well, surely value trying, is you know, in the eyes of your client. Imagine how um, a person who is that deeply different, differently rooted in um, in his perception of the situation, how is he uh finding his way in a situation when everyone around in the team his leader his team is is looking at the same thing differently he doesn't he obviously stand out stand out and and is you know is, is kind of like this black sheep even or i don't know how to put it but i imagine it might be tricky from time to time to actually follow these rules in the room oh, sure. of people who don't play the same game Oh, yeah. And there are leaders who are very adept at surrounding themselves with servants Mm -hmm. as opposed to partners. But then the question to anyone with self-worth is, do you want to work for somebody like that? Exactly. So the the outcomes eventually can be really almost the same. I mean, the customer can be satisfied by both approaches. But I guess uh, it all comes down to... Us but being in, satisfied in the relation as well. But in practice, we build much better relationships mm-hmm. when we have self-worth based relationships. I've worked with professionals who have doubled and tripled their fees and that they're charging to, to clients because of the fact that they're trusted advisors, because they're willing to stand up for what they believe in and they're willing to stand up for an approach. Mm. It really, you know, it's bold. Of, with it, the right it's very kind of bold clients, and radical. It builds trust. The right kind of yeah, that's the uh, that's the, the right key, kind I guess. Of that builds trust. And so I, I understand it won't want... it won't resonate in every context. Um, no, well, nothing will resonate in every context. Yeah, even being a servant doesn't resonate in every context. Couldn't agree with you more. So it's which context do you want to be in? How do you increase self worth? Um, well, I've written about 300 pages on it, but I'll try to, uh, I'll try to summarize. Um, above all, there's, there's usually a moment of decision. There's a moment of declaration. Um, and it might take a little time to get to that moment, but there's a moment usually where people choose to be on their own side, no matter what. 
to be that unconditional friend to themselves, no matter what anyone else is saying around them, and no matter what they're saying in their own mind. Because the real problem here isn't the external voices, the big problem is the inner voice that's constantly saying, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. So there's an example in the book of a lady called Mary, um, mm -hmm. who on a Sunday afternoon, you know, when the voice was saying, you should be, you know, tidying the house, or you should be getting ready for work, or you should, whatever. Um, she sat down and she went, look, I, I am enough, I do enough, and I have enough. And, and just like that, that was, that was her intuitive. She didn't sit down and, you know, make up those words. It, they, they more or less came to her as a kind of massive declaration, if you want. And when she told that story in the group, uh, in the pilot groups, a lot of people actually borrowed that mantra from her because it became, it became the declaration, if you like, upon which a lot of subsequent action gets, uh, gets formed. It's not so much the actions, it's the intention behind the action that's important. So suppose that somebody decides to go to the gym or to pay attention to what they're eating. They can either do that as another set of conditions to feel good about themselves, or they can do it as an expression of something that already is, like self-worth. And it's changing the intention behind the action. We still want to do our best for our clients, but at the end of the day, what's our intention? Is, is it our intention to get good ratings or is it our intention to be useful in that situation? So intention is incredibly important when we're developing self-worth rather than self-esteem. Nothing more to add. <laughs> Thanks, John. It was a really interesting conversation and a really interesting book. I uh, must honestly admit that uh, I am I am trying to uh, see how this approach fits my current state uh, of situation, uh, and we'll see if, uh, if maybe introducing some of these rules uh, will help me uh, with with moving forward. And I do highly recommend our listeners to grab yourself a par pair of the Self for Safari by John Nealand. Uh, because from the personal perspective, it's also a professional perspective, not only the professional, personal, uh, this book is really, uh, it, it is really interesting and eye-opening. Thank you, John, for, for sharing your thoughts and for joining me today in the, in the IT Insights podcast. Thanks for the invitation, Michal. Thank you. IT Leadership Insights. Visit us at www.future-processing.com and let's start a project together.